This week, Charles Kuralt's On the Road team covers a story going back thousands of years. It began in the deserts of Egypt, then on to Washington, and ultimately to five other American cities. Don't let the opening fool you. Before he's through, Charlie unfolds a tale of romance, political intrigue, and possibly even murder. Well, I thought it was about time that this program, which is supposed to be about people, paid a little attention to the most absorbing personality to hit Washington in recent memory. A southerner who became head of state of a rich and powerful nation, hailed by great crowds, but who remains to this day enigmatic and distant and mysterious. I don't mean him. I mean him. Tutankhamun, the boy pharaoh of Egypt, has sent Washington right on its ear. Since way back last November, hundreds of thousands of people have waited in line, some of them five or six hours or longer, for the chance that they might get in to see the treasures of King Tut. We were in the neighborhood one day in the on-the-road bus, so we thought we'd stop by the National Gallery of Art and see what it is that makes people wait so long to meet a king. He was only a boy, not an important pharaoh at all, raised to the throne when he was nine years old and dead at 18 in the year 1325 B.C. He lived and died a hundred years before Moses led his people out of Egypt. It was all so long ago. But when you come around a corner here and look into his child's eyes, you feel the shock of human recognition. He was just a boy. He sat in this little chair as a boy, almost certainly sat in this chair. Any child would like it. He played games at this board. The game is called Thieves, easy for a child to learn. When he was older, he went hunting birds with a bow and arrow. You know how kids love bows and arrows. He must have become pretty good at it. It says on this fan that the plumes that used to be on it came from ostriches he shot himself. The Egyptians thought he was a god, Tutankhamun, living image of the god Amun. Well, you can believe that if you want to. He was a boy, and he's been dead for 3,302 years. So what are all these people doing, waiting here in line so patiently for hour after hour? I think they've come here for more than a glimpse of his golden relics. I think they've come here for a glimpse of him. You know how celebrities always hang around together. Robert Redford has been here, and Elizabeth Taylor, Billy Carter, the Rockefellers, the Kissingers. I saw Mrs. Mondale in there a few minutes ago. After all these years, 33 centuries, this Egyptian boy is a bigger celebrity than any of them. Even J. Carter Brown, the director of the National Gallery, sometimes looks into his eyes and thinks about that. He had a very beautiful wife. Uh, she was young. She was the daughter of the beautiful Nefertiti, who must have been one of the most beautiful women in history. The whole sexual relationships in those days are very complex. They married their sisters and their mothers, and they had children by all these people. And this was considered a religious thing to do. There was a uh, great conviction that uh, the pharaoh was a god and therefore couldn't marry anyone outside of his immediate family. It was an archaeologist named Howard Carter who restored King Tut to celebrity one November afternoon in 1922. After years of sweltering disappointment in the Nile Valley, he drilled a hole with trembling hands, he said, into the door of a tomb he had finally found, inserted a candle, and peered in. His patron, Lord Carnarvon, asked anxiously, Can you see anything? It was all I could do, Howard Carter said, to get out the words, Yes, wonderful things. The wonderful things will leave Washington this week and go on to Chicago, New Orleans, Los Angeles, Seattle, and New York before returning home to Cairo in 1979. <laughs> if you go to see these things when they're in your part of the country, I warn you, you're going to find yourself thinking not only about the archaeological discovery, spectacular as it was, and not only about the craftsmanship of ancient Egypt, stunning as it is. There is more to think about. While this boy was king, great things happened in Egypt. The throne was moved back to the old capital of Thebes, and old gods and goddesses once deposed were restored, and old temples once closed were reopened. Tutankhamun, 10 or 11 years old at the time, couldn't have had anything to do with any of that. 
It was the work of his advisors, among them his chief vizier, a scheming old man named I. But in the meantime, what about this boy? And why did he die so young? That's what you'll be thinking about as you look into his eyes. What fascinates me is that the power behind the throne was the old boy, I, who had been the power behind his predecessor and had even been quite powerful in the previous regime, which had been back uh, here at the capital. And we've seen this happen in our own day, uh, puppets. Uh, it seems to me very clear that this was a power play, and the fact that he died uh, from an unknown cause, and yet there is a, an indentation in his skull, uh, me, makes cynical me think that there was some foul play afoot. And that I took over, as he then did, he took over his tomb, he took over all the panoply of being a pharaoh, and uh, really moved in. Now, you can say he had to because the state was under a lot of pressure. It was a far-flung empire, and they were under attack. And you couldn't have boy kings running around uh, handling things with uh, that kind of emergency in a national scale. But whatever the motivations, I was a strong man, and he came out on top. It could be equally true that someone dropped that skull uh, in the process of mummification. I don't think the royal mummifiers were that butterfingered. Uh, they uh, uh, were carefully chosen. And why would they be that casual with a god's skull? So that how did that indentation get there? Uh, it was a rough world. There was palace intrigue. Uh, knowing what we do about human nature, which has changed very little over those three millennia, uh, the fact that he was... Uh, put quietly out of the way uh, makes an awful lot of sense to me. And so what we have here may be a 3,300-year-old case of murder. If that was the manner of his death, it makes his life all the more fascinating. Whoever murdered this boy must have thought that once in his grave he'd be forgotten. No prophet in history has ever been more mistaken. A better prophet was the anonymous artist who carved this chalice out of alabaster and devotion and inscribed it to his handsome young king, dead at 18. A Washington mystery man. Another in our gallery of people worth talking about. I'm Dan Rather, and that's Who's Who.